Well done on persevering through Lent, having got to the uh, last of these talks and um, in the graveyard shift, I'm afraid you're stuck with me tonight. And uh, just before we uh, begin, I want to um, uh, say a really big thank you to everyone who's been involved in the uh, lecture series. Uh, it's been really great to be able to share between the churches and have participants from uh, lots of different traditions. It's been really great. So thank you for coming and bringing your wisdom, experience and background in conversation with one another. Uh, also want to say a big thank you to the team uh, here who've been supporting it. Uh, it's been really great to have the uh, concert stewards helping um, and also I'm conscious that the, the Verger team have been staying on later than they ordinarily would. So uh, really grateful to uh, all of them. Thank you. And then um, next week, uh, I'm due to be meeting with the other four people who were talking in this series and just thinking how it's gone, reflecting on it. And um, if you have any feedback which you haven't already shared and could do so with your minister, please do so by next Sunday and we will pick it all up in our wash-up conversation on uh, Monday. So, just to return to some of the principles which we have been reflecting on throughout this series. We're mindful that not only is there going to be a general election in this country here, but that 2024 is infamously going to be the most democratic year in human history. Over half of the 8 billion people on planet Earth will have an invitation to go to the polls in a national vote this year. And some of those votes will even be free and fair. <laughs> Not thinking of anywhere in particular. So we know that democracy itself is going to be under the microscope and that um, as Christians we are called to, uh, to do some of that microscope work and to reflect on how our faith engages with the issues that are important to people, to the politicians and that are going to be on our news agendas. So over the uh, five weeks we have been reflecting on those topics which the five speakers thought were going to be particularly prominent uh, in relation to the general election here in the UK. Environment, we heard from Mark Cheatham at the Methodists, health and social care from Pete Olfen from the Baptist Church, education from Katie Fitzsimmons, the diocesan director of education. And last week, John Proctor from St. Osmond's Catholic Church was telling us about immigration and refugees. So tonight we're wrapping up by thinking about uh, economics and deliberately titled this Just Economics, not because I am talking about economics only, merely economics, but to try to say something about economics which are right, which are righteous, which are just, which resonate with the Christian tradition. Now, unsurprisingly, that is easier said than done, and there are a number of reasons for that. Caveat number one is that my economic studies stopped in the last ice age when I was 18 at uh, A-level. And I'm conscious that within the room tonight there are, is enormous wisdom from people who have worked in different aspects of finance and uh, economics. So um, I'm uh, uh, tinkering around the edges of what some people have given their life to. Um, secondly, um, we've known with all five of these issues that uh, it's very tricky to uh, explore them in a way which is uh, constructive, helpful, without getting party political. But we're going to have another go at that tonight with economics. And then thirdly, turning to the topic uh, more precisely, um, it's very easy to, uh, it's not easy to talk about economics which are just because of some of the inherent contradictions which are within economics and inherent challenges. And that is because no economic model is perfect. By that I mean that the objectives which a government might seek to pursue through their economic policy, one objective might conflict with another. 
they might indeed be mutually incompatible. And I'll give you two of the, uh, the famous ones uh, here. Trade-off between inflation and employment. For some governments, it's really important to be pursuing a high level of unemployment. We know the role and the value of jobs and the income and the security and everything which that gives to people. However, every economy needs a certain level of what's called structural unemployment as people are changing jobs, seeking for new opportunities. And if, that, um, if the structural unemployment falls too low, um, then actually what you end up doing is that uh, employers can't uh, find the people they need uh, to do the jobs which they have, so they put wages up, uh, people with wages end up uh, competing for, for goods with what they purchase, and you end up with a wage price spiral. So uh, pursuing uh, uh, complete unemployment, it's an impossible goal, and in part because as you get near complete unemployment, you end up with inflation. And then inflation presents challenges because people find the real value of their wages are getting eroded. On the other side, those governments which like to bear down on inflation and the problems, because they know the problems which inflation causes, they might do that by setting high interest rates. And the challenge of high interest rates is that individuals and companies have less money to spend, businesses don't invest in uh, uh, new developments, new jobs, and the unemployment rate goes up. So there's a trade-off between uh, fighting down, in, in, bearing down on inflation and bearing down on unemployment. And similarly, there is another tension between uh, that very laudable goal of redistributing wealth and an economy which grows, because um, if wealth is distributed completely perfectly, um, those um, uh, engines of entrepreneurialism and innovation will struggle to see how am I going to get rewarded for developing my uh, idea. On the other hand, if you just pursue rampant growth, then you end up with great wealth uh, inequalities and all sorts of social welfare and moral problems which go with that. So no economic model is perfect, and we've got some of these tensions which uh, confront all governments and confront people who are reflecting on economics. Now we know that um, in answering some of these questions, um, setting some of these uh, objectives for government, that there are two predominant economic systems uh, which uh, are in contrast to one another. I just want to remind ourselves of them and the pros and cons of each. Large number of uh, economies around the world are capitalistic and uh, capitalist uh, economics values the role of private enterprise in uh, innovating, creating jobs <coughs> and increasing the gross domestic product of a country. And those who advocate uh, a strongly capitalist economy are not too hot on large government. They prefer small government. They think that the role of government is to defend the market system because it's the market system which is at the heart of the economic model and that the role of government then is to maintain law and order. If you have a lot of crime, you don't have a, a, a thriving um, market. To defend the country as a whole through national defence and through providing some basic structures around trading like weights and measures and contracts. And advocates of this model uh, are cautious about the government intervening, for example, to protect jobs uh, if a, a significant employer is going to go under. Number of advantages of this, um, capitalist economies are uh, lauded for the way in which they value freedom of choice and for the efficient allocation that they make of resources. And crucially, as I've been saying already, um, effort is rewarded um, through the, the profit motive. There is, of course, a shadow side to this, um, and if resources are allocated according to profit and not according to need, there is a very real risk that those who are disadvantaged in those societies and economics, e economies um, through health or disability, education and so on, uh, will not have the opportunities and uh, not have the support that they need to uh, f flourish and to thrive in their lives. 
The alternative um, economic model is uh, what's known as the command system or the communist economic system. And in so many ways, it contrasts the capitalist model that we've just been looking at. It values the role of government in uh, supporting the whole society, and in particular through creating jobs and the value which goes with that. And in order to do that, uh, you're likely to see the government intervening in the, uh, um, uh, in the market sector, potentially in um, centralising, uh, making public a significant number of businesses and goods, protecting uh, businesses against international competition, uh, high levels of regulation uh, alongside that public ownership. And command uh, economies um, balance the long-term planning, often through uh, taxing uh, and, and spending. Lots of advantages of these uh, systems, um, one of which is that resources are allocated according to need, uh, and in particular, <coughs> um, the, the value which comes from uh, people having a job, high levels of uh, employment, and uh, a more balanced distribution of wealth within the society. Downside, again, is the, the, uh, the opposite of that. Um, there's less uh, scope for innovation because uh, those who might have a bright new idea, something to develop, are not going to find their uh, idea, scheme, innovation uh, rewarded through uh, profit. And uh, classically, command uh, economics, because everyone has a job, the state just does its thing, can end up being uh, quite in, uh, inefficient, um, spending money on things which probably don't need spending money on. And there's also risk, as we know, of um, communist uh, societies uh, becoming dictatorships, undemocratic. So those are the two poles at the opposite end of the spectrum. And of course, we know that um, there's no perfectly capitalist, 100% capitalist economy with uh, no government sector. And we, don't, and we also know that there is no perfect, not even North Korea, um, completely uh, command economy where the government does absolutely everything. Uh, all uh, economies are somewhere between these two opposite ends of the spectrum. And in the middle, in particular here in Western Europe, there are a number of what we might call uh, mixed economies. Um, if capitalist economics resonates with uh, right-wing politics, command economics with left-wing politics. Um, and in practice, there is no pure command or capitalist economy. There are many which are in between. And um, here's a graph from the BBC, um, conveniently showing uh, the UK position in the middle of some countries there. Uh, the United States uh, having a smaller tax take as a percentage of gross domestic product. France having a, a larger one. We know that the United States tends towards the capitalist end, small government end of the spectrum, and that France uh, has a large uh, government sector, uh, strong social welfare within their society. Now hopefully, of course, mixed economies will have the best of both worlds. Try to provide a safety welfare net under the most vulnerable without losing the entrepreneurial spirit of the free market. And of course the risk is that you get uh, the disadvantages of uh, both models and the gifts of neither. Growth disincentivized and a government sector which becomes expensive and inefficient. There's a trade-off there. Now, I have to at this point confess that I do personally have a preference for the mixed economy. It might just be that that's what I know, what we know here in Britain. But I want to suggest also that um, within the best of a mixed economy, you might get something which balances some, uh, some potentially antagonistic Christian principles, antagonistic principles from our tradition. Let me suggest that one of those is freedom. Christianity values uh, freedom, uh, the call on the individual to uh, trust in Christ, uh, and the freedom which we have to make that choice. Christianity also, of course, has a, a deep uh, a heart and care 
for those who are vulnerable and um, the need to protect those who are innocent, poor, oppressed, and so on. <clears throat> and those two uh, principles uh, hopefully come together in, a, uh, in the moral way in which Christians live their lives. Because for a Christian, our freedom is not necessarily to grab everything that we want, do what we want, uh, and to uh, purely pursue the, the profit motive. Um, there's a quote here from John Paul II. You can find it in lots of different forms, but one version of it says this. Uh, freedom consists not in doing what we like, but in having the right to do what we ought. We are set free not to do what we like, to pursue our own self-interest, but because uh, God, Christ, wants us to do what we ought, to do the right thing, including that care for the vulnerable. And this, of course, is where we come to the, the shadow side of this. Because in having freedom, we make mistakes. Freedom is the basis of so much sin. And economics and sin, I suggest to you, have a lot to say to one another. During this season of Lent, in particular, we've been reminded that everybody sins, every falls short of the glory of God, as Paul tells the Romans. And I want to suggest to you that there is sin embedded in all economic systems. And it re resonates with the Christian idea of original sin, the idea that we are all um, flawed and faulty. And I'm sorry uh, here to folks from the cathedral, because I've been talking about original sin too much during Lent, but um, here's one more crack at it in relation to um, economics. Now, original sin, um, is an idea particularly embedded in the Western Christian tradition by St. Augustine of Hippo in the late 4th, early 5th century. And he says that sin is inherent in all people because it's passed on through sex from Adam. Now that's fine if you accept that Adam is a historical figure. The vast majority of Christians in this country would not. But I do still believe in the sinfulness of all people that we know that we're all imperfect and flawed. And actually, I think that economics gives us a really good window into why this is so. And the guy who particularly helped me move beyond the Augustine model uh, is the American theologian, 20th century theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr. And he says this in his book, On the Nature and Destiny of Man. He says that all humans are creatures of infinite wants. We always want a little bit more. We want something else. We want uh, a little bit more. Whether we have lots or have little, we always have infinite wants and a little bit more. But we know that we live in a world of finite resources, limited goods, limited services. And when those two clash up with one another, our infinite desires and wants with the limited resources of the world, we end up with greed. It's a, a wonderfully economic model of sin and um, I think it checks out. I also think it has a number of implications. Um, <clears throat> one of which is theological. And that is the, the forces which drive our economic systems about buying and selling and competition, uh, which are very important to flourishing economies. Underlying it theologically is this fault which Niebuhr rightly puts his finger on, that we are creatures of infinite wants in a world of finite resources. Economics is about the allocation of finite resources. Um, so there's something inherently sinful within our economic systems. And that perhaps explains why governments can't pursue all the wonderful objectives that they might want to, as we said near the beginning. And I think there are some socio-political implications of this um, about uh, what we need from government and from politicians in order to, you're not going to drive the sinfulness out of the economic system, but to try and put some framework around it. And I suggest that the Christian tradition has a lot to offer here, 
to our leaders about uh, how they can assist to reduce the sinfulness of our economic systems. And maybe I'm being um, uh, wildly ambitious in suggesting that this is possible. I certainly have no doubt that it's not perfect. But here are two areas where I think our politicians can make a difference. Embedding Christian principles into government and economic structures should guard against two things. Firstly, that sort of individualism which grabs, grabs, grabs just for self with patent disregard for uh, others and in particular for the needy and the vulnerable. That's core Christian stuff. And I think also as people of faith we are mindful um, that our God is a God who has a plan. Our God is a God for the long term and that our society, politics and economics needs to embed something of that to be working for the good for the long term for our children and grandchildren and the future of God's planet and not to be sacrificing that to short-termism. But short-termism, I suggest to you, is a real problem. And I want to spend uh, most of the rest of the time we have uh, here, or what I'm going to say, uh, really pinpointing some of the problems of short-termism, where it comes from, and three areas in particular where I think we see it. <clears throat> I suggest to you that um, short-termism is a sad byproduct of democracy. If you're going to go to the polls every three, four, five years, the policies which governments seek to implement are, um, are geared to the next time they're up for election. And actually, there are some issues uh, which need longer term planning than this, generational issues which need to get beyond the uh, shortness of the electoral cycle. A um, good example of this here in uh, Britain is this problem which has been going on for, for, for years, for decades, to give uh, social care parity with some of the, um, the values and priorities which Pete was talking about around our healthcare system and to get our social care system to integrate better with our healthcare system, to actually allow our healthcare system to, uh, to work better. And uh, a lot of this was enshrined in the report by Andrew Dilnot, a uh, good Anglican, um, about um, how we're going to fund social care for the, uh, the long-term good of this country. But because of the commitment which is required in the cross-party consensus, uh, a lot of his report uh, remains to be realised. And if you think our electoral cycle is bad in terms of failing to get long-term stuff happening in this country, the American electoral cycle, this bizarre way in which they go out electing their presidents, drawn out over months and months, repeating itself every four years, um, has an impact not just on that country, but on the whole world. Um, some of the, the tensions which Mr. Biden has been uh, facing about, you know, his response to the, the, the great sadnesses in the Holy Land has been about, um, yes, a response to the issues, but also how that's playing on the domestic agenda as he heads towards uh, re-election in the autumn. So short-termism is a worrying byproduct of democracy. And... Um, <clears throat> A second aspect of this, um, I suggest, is I need to be careful here with my audience, but I suggest that um, the greater propensity of the senior generation to vote means that politicians hone their policies towards the silver voter, and that this can create issues of intergenerational inequity. It's really interesting to see in the uh, current budget that the 2% uh, off national insurance um, was uh, quite unusual in this regard, in that you know, budgets often have um, vote-winning headlines um, for the, the more mature voter. Taking 2% off uh, national uh, insurance is something which will put money back into uh, those of working age pockets uh, in particular. 
So intergenerational inequality, I think, is a real issue. And I think it's something which has got worse in this country. And I want to look at three areas where I think this has got worse. Uh, and it's a product of some of this uh, short-termism and the electoral cycle. The first area is around housing. We've known for a long time that house prices have been rising faster than incomes. And that's great if you own a house. That's really problematic if you don't. And that's particularly the case, of course, for those who are younger, starting out in their careers. And um, what this uh, graph here is showing is how um, it's the ratio of house prices to average earnings. And although in the north of England, uh, it's been, been fairly constant, uh, although increasing a little bit since uh, the start of the graph in the late 1980s down uh, until um, more recent years. Um, but in other parts of the UK, especially in uh, London, uh, things have been racing away. And uh, the inability of the young to buy houses in the way which was possible for a previous generation has all sorts of knock-ons about people working harder, being more stressed, taking uh, uh, more than one job, um, about people waiting uh, longer to start families, all sorts of issues there, um, people living in substandard accommodation. There are no easy solutions to the housing crisis. It has been apparent for many, many years, cutting across governments of both colours. And at the end of the day, house prices are a matter of demand and supply. And if you're going to get away from this problem of prices outstripping wages, then there are only two things that you can do. You can either reduce the demand for housing, or you can increase the quantity supplied. So on the demand side, there are a couple of things that can be done. Um, you could encourage people to be living in larger household units, encourage people to be sharing housing um, uh, wherever possible. Um, that was the de facto uh, result uh, of the married person's tax allowance, for example, uh, which got abolished um, 25 years ago now. Um, all sorts of reasons why that might have been got, got rid of, but one of the, uh, the effects of it was it incentivised larger housing units. And as John was so very helpfully probing for us uh, last uh, week, uh, another way um, would be to reduce the, the net migration figure into this country. But as John was saying, for all sorts of reasons, that is neither possible nor pragmatic. Um, theoretically not possible before Brexit, theoretically now possible, but for all sorts of reasons, governments um, are, are not pursuing that particular policy. Very good reasons, indeed. So I, I suspect the solution, there's probably not much that can be done on the demand side, unless you're going to go down um, those two, uh, one of those two routes, which uh, would be very controversial. So what about the other side, then? Uh, it's equally controversial, I'm afraid, trying to increase the quantity of housing supplied. Well, one way of doing that is to build houses uh, for less. Um, and you can do that by um, you know, reducing building standards, making houses cheaper to knock up. I suggest to you that that is really not the route we want to be going down. We need houses to be much more um, efficient, especially around um, uh, things like heating. Lowering building standards is really not the way to go. Another way to go is just to be building more houses. Uh, as John was saying last week, uh, in order to uh, keep the, um, uh, the house price to earnings ratio flat, we need to be producing something like 350,000 houses a year in this country, and at best we get to a quarter of a million. And that is, it's that gap which is why the graph is going in the way that it is. Um, if you increase the quantity supplied, building more, and that of course means building up in cities and building out uh, as well, uh, there are all sorts of uh, tensions and difficulties which go with that. But housing, I suggest to you, is one really important uh, issue. 
Second area of uh, intergenerational uh, inequality is one that um, has been apparent in the last few years. And that is an unintended consequence of the response which the government chose to make to coronavirus. And that is that effectively the young have been asked to pay twice. Uh, Katie touched on a bit of this in her talk about education and the impact of the virus and the impact of the uh, restrictions. Four years ago, government was in panic mode. It was pursuing just one objective, uh, which was to uh, shield the country from this dreadful disease, to turn the curve of the infection rate. Um, and in pursuing that one policy objective, um, the, the implications of that pursuit on all other areas of uh, society um, uh, were, um, put it politely, should we say, soft peddled and lots of stuff I think was uncosted, including on the young. The impact on schooling, the related impact on mental health. The young were asked to pay once in that way for um, the response to coronavirus. But secondly, I suggest to you that in an age when uh, the young need resources to be uh, investing in things like housing, they're actually going to be asked to pay twice because of the debt which the government incurred to run things like furlough. Although the latest budget has been a tax-cutting one, we know that the projections for beyond the election are that taxes will be heading up. That's what this graph is showing. Sorry, it's not a very good one for those who are far back. What it is showing that is that the total tax take as a part of the, uh, the overall economy, GDP, is going to have to increase if the government is going to balance its books and bear down on government debt. And that means that the, those who are working and going into work are going to have to pay a higher proportion of their income uh, in taxes to pay off the debt which was incurred four years ago. That, I suggest to you, is the second area of where we have some intergenerational inequality. And then the third one, and the real biggie, is of course to do with the environment and the long-term problems which we have been stacking up for decades and in industrialised countries like this one for centuries. And that simply is, we know uh, around climate change now, that uh, the economy doesn't price in the real cost of consuming fossil fuels. Uh, we know the cost of extracting them from the ground and sticking them into our boilers uh, or our stoves or, uh, and into our cars, but uh, the, uh, the market for um, diesel, petrol, coal, gas doesn't price in the long-term impact of burning fossil fuels on our climate. And this is the real biggie, which um, is, is the greatest challenge for the world of our age. But the risk is that um, the consumption of the past is going to have an ever-increasing impact on the future. So we really need policies which go well beyond each electoral cycle, generational policies to uh, reverse uh, these trends and to bear down on our consumption of carbon. And we have actually in this country been very successful at that. And the per capita carbon consumption in this country is half what it was 30 years ago. I suspect that's in part because we've off-sourced a lot of our production to other countries but uh, other countries have had graphs going in other directions uh, and we still have a long, long way to go. At the minute, there is nowhere near enough electricity in uh, the net, the grid, for our future requirements, especially around heating. You are in a, uh, a gas, a principally gas-heated barn of a building tonight. Sorry about that. In the marginal months of April and October, turning the heating off in this uh, cathedral uh, saves the work of 24 mature trees in terms of um, uh, soaking up uh, that carbon dioxide. Uh, Salisbury Cathedral has a long way to go um, if we're going to um, decarbonise and play our part, which we are committed to doing and we're looking at hard. Um, part of that then is as a country we do need more um, renewable electricity. We need uh, green innovation for um, uh, homes and businesses which are more fuel efficient, uh, not less. 
and uh, we need in particular to be moving towards alternative heating solutions, of which I suspect ground source heat pumps, wherever possible, are the most efficient. So I want to suggest to you that just economics are long-term economics, things which puncture beyond the ding-dong of the four or five year electoral cycle. And as Christians, the way in which we bring our theology, our prayer, our faith, our reflections to some of these big political footballs is really, really important, despite the inherent uh, flaws and weaknesses of economic systems. And I suggest to you, friends, that this brings us back to this solemn season of Lent, because Lent is about the long term, it is about the process of sanctification within each of us as we grow to become more like Jesus. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It's not a short-term thing. It is the quest, the challenge of our lifetimes. Christian holiness is a lifelong thing. And Lent bears witness to some of these long-term things. The principles of less now if we and our successors are going to have more, or dare I say it, the same later. Lent bears witness to God's love for the world in saving Christ, in sending Christ to uh, redeem it and to transform it. And as we head through Lent now into Passion Tide, and we are reflecting on the suffering of Christ, uh, his commitment to stand up for what was right, what was just, and not do the expedient and short-term thing, be that to run away or to conform. Lent underlines the long-termism which we need uh, as people of faith and as a country. So I suggest to you we need to be asking our politicians questions in a number of areas. We need to be asking them about where they seek cross-party consensus for the long-term benefit of this country and how they are going to be held accountable by future generations for that. We need somehow, and I don't know how, them to be able to really get agreement on these areas around uh, housing, things like um, justice around social care and around climate change and around how we might uh, respond to future pandemics, which both deals with the presenting problem, but without ignoring the knock-on impacts uh, on the young in particular. In order to do this, politicians also, I think, need to be getting serious about uh, inspiring those generations which are less likely to vote, less likely to participate, um, in the political process and in the real value of that and the significance of that and, and the joy and the importance of uh, being able to be democratic. Um, uh, for me, I don't think that's the, the sort of thing about you know, lowering the voting age to 16. I'm not sure that helps. But somehow we need to be incentivizing and encouraging participation, free participation, I'm not sold on the Australian system of compulsory voting either, but um, free and full participation in uh, voting across the generations. And as we engage our politicians about this, I suggest to you, if we're thinking about just economics, some big Christian themes come out, which we've been touching on. The stuff about equity, about fairness, about protection and justice for the vulnerable about how we can protect against um, untrammeled greed which doesn't look out for our neighbour. And then perhaps also reminding people that uh, economics isn't everything and that uh, maybe uh, we need to be focusing more on the happiness stuff uh, instead of affluence. Um, if we are serving mammon, it won't necessarily be making us any happier. One other question which you might want to think about, and I encourage you to think about in your groups and to talk about and to raise with your ministers as we head towards the election 
do we collectively want to be organising a hustings as churches? Um, if we do, we need to think about it and to be on the front foot. Finally, uh, before we break for uh, reflections and questions in, in small groups, um, I want to share uh, some wisdom from somebody who knows a lot more about economics than I do. Um, those of you who are here uh, at the cathedral, um, have been here at the cathedral for some time, uh, will likely to uh, know Graham Turner. Graham Turner was the first BBC economics correspondent, has retired here to uh, Salisbury, lives just around the corner, sadly can't be with us here tonight. Knowing that I was going to do this talk in uh, a few weeks' time, and I was, uh, when I was visiting Graham a couple of weeks ago, I asked him about it and I said, well, how are you going to solve this? What would you do if you were up here as the BBC's first economics correspondent? And he left me with three quotes, three very simple quotes, which I, I share with you, because I, I thought these were all great. <clears throat> the first thing he said was, that economics is always wrong. <laughs> and by that, Graham meant that if you present one economic argument, somebody comes along with you know, more statistics and damn lies and undermines it. Uh, there's always a counter-argument which can be produced. So the first thing Graham said was that economics is always wrong. And the second thing he said, as a man of faith, is that Christianity is always right. And that feels, we know it's true, but we know it's so hard as well when we argue among ourselves, have our differences, and, and we know the implications of, you know, when faith doesn't always get it right uh, and has some terrible consequences. But at the heart, we know that Christianity is always right. And Graham's third aphorism was this. And he, he was thinking about the cathedral, but um, uh, uh, I suggest it applies to all our churches. He said, if there's anyone at the cathedral who worships economics, I suggest they find a different God. If economics is wrong and Christianity is right, the end of the syllogism is that don't worship economics, find a different God. Uh, I thought that was really great, so I um, uh, want to leave with that. Okay, um, we've got to the point where um, I'm going to shut up. Um, I suggest take a few minutes together to uh, reflect, as we've done in recent weeks. Turn to a neighbour, um, ideally somebody who you don't know, um, and uh, share your thoughts on a little bit of what we've been reflecting on tonight. Let's take probably about five minutes, and after that the uh, roving mic will come round if anyone wants to share any questions. Uh, if you are framing a question to ask, please keep it focused. Um, especially on the stuff we've been thinking about tonight. It'll certainly help me, and it might help us all to focus on the issue that you want to ask about. Let's take five minutes.